Gentlemen, we're live and recording. Thank you. All right. All righty, as the webinar is opening up, I, I see uh, we've got our numbers are clicking up quite quickly here. So uh, we've got uh, Dr. Nash with us today. Looking forward to his presentation on, on indirect restorations. I uh, had some questions about uh, why we didn't have webinars last Thursday and Friday. Uh, that conflicted with our uh, WAGD Master Track program that we host uh, every quarter where we do uh, three days of hands on CE. And so, um, Unfortunately, we couldn't do that live at our educational center at SeaTac, Washington. That's, uh, that's uh, in between Seattle and Tacoma out at the airport where we can do live courses. We've got um, chairs, uh, uh, dental chairs, so you, you can do hands-on courses. We have an implant continuum. You'll see that uh, Dr. Yassin uh, teaches that, and uh, he's doing some um, an implant study club here. I think he's got three more of those uh, scheduled before now, and when we're supposed to go back in Washington State. Uh, for those of you uh, that haven't been on one of our webinars before or use Zoom, just play around with the interface there. You can't hurt it. If you get knocked off, you can just jump right back on. Uh, you can adjust volume. Uh, today, uh, you're not going to have the ability to speak with Dr. Nash, but if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A uh, tab there and we'll get to it. The chat side, let's just leave that for, you know, little comments, that kind of stuff. But if you have a question that uh, you want uh, Dr. Nash to answer at the end of his presentation, uh, put it in there. Um, for those of you uh, that are looking at those questions, uh, I believe we'll have the ability to upvote on those questions as well. So if you have a question in there that you'd like to see the answer to, uh, please click on it. Uh, we've got a lot more speakers coming up. Uh, Valerie and I, uh, our executive director of the Washington AGD, and uh, our panelist, Dr. Gary Hayamoto, are putting those together along with our webmaster, uh, Dr. Presset. Um, you may even see uh, up to five or six additional webinars added onto this little PowerPoint that we're going to play at the end of Dr. Nash's lecture. So stick around there. You can use the QR codes to navigate to the Academy of General Dentistry, uh, or the Washington Academy of General Dentistry, pardon me, website. That's where you can register. Or the QR code will take you directly to the registration link. We get the question, will these webinars be available to watch after? Yes, they are. They'll be on YouTube. Go to Washington Academy of General Dentistry, and you'll be able to find those webinars there. We'll leave those up for a period of time, but they're not going to be there forever. Uh, anybody is welcome to watch those. Unfortunately, we cannot give you CE credit for watching um, the webinar when it's on YouTube. Uh, Maybe down the road, we're working on our on-demand uh, CE video stuff, and that might be a possibility in the future. Um, just a reminder, this Washington Academy of General Dentistry Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE series is brought to you by the Washington Academy of General Dentistry, the University of Washington School of Dentistry CE uh, department, and uh, we've got support from Comet USA, Patterson Dental, Seattle King County Dental Society, Snohomish County Dental Society, Pierce County Dis Dental Society, and uh, we're being uh, promoted and shared our information up in Canada via the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentists and Prostodontics. Uh, great to see the number of Canadians that have logged on to these uh, webinars. I think we're at over 1,300 uh, Canadians now. So that's uh, fantastic. Hey, tomorrow, Terry Harris is going to be speaking. And you know, Terry Harris from Harris Biomedical. He uh, uh, does a lot of the Wish OSHA manuals for us here in Washington State and elsewhere. And he's going to have an update um, on COVID-19 uh, after speaking with the state on Friday. Um, on that flyer, you'll see there's an email address and you can email questions to Terry Harris beforehand. Um, quite frankly, it's just going to be, you're not going to have a chance to ask a, a question tomorrow. We have over 3,000 uh, participants 
on that uh, webinar. Uh, there is a chance that if you try and log in um, because of numbers, uh, you may not be able to get into that webinar, even if you have registered. Uh, unfortunately, we just don't know what's going to happen with that large number of participants. So we'll be opening uh, that webinar up early uh, tomorrow so you can get in there. Um, that's open to dentists, hygienists, assistants, staff members, whoever you want to see um, th that webinar. And everybody uh, is eligible for CE credit. That CE credit is going to come from the University of Washington School of Dentistry CE department. And you will likely see that in two or three days. Uh, for those of you that are AGD members, we are going to report your CE credit directly to the Academy of General Dentistry. That probably won't show up on your transcript for another couple of weeks. So uh, just hold tight. It'll be there eventually. But save the PDF that you get from the University of Washington School of Dentistry, just in case there's any confusion down the road. Um, our numbers are cl clicking up real quick here. We're uh, over 500 and um, we're scheduled to start around 9.30 or so. We're going to give it just a little extra time because we have uh, almost 1,200 people scheduled for this webinar today. And for a lot of people, they're new to Zoom and Zoom, as you know, probably makes you jump through some hoops, updating your software, etc. So we're going to be just a little flexible here. Uh, for you young dentists and uh, students out there, remember August 15th, we have our Crown Preparation 101 course. Uh, unfortunately, we had to move this out of May. It'll be in August. Uh, again, that's being sponsored by Comet, Benair, and uh, Kettenbach. And uh, thank you for your support. It's a low-cost CE event. It's an all-day course that walks you through seating the patient through uh, anesthetic, build up, prepping the teeth, provisionalization, and releasing your patient at the end of the day. So uh, it's kind of an all-encompassing uh, walk through a crown preparation. Um, yes, for those of you that are just coming on board, yeah, it's 9.30. We're going to give it just a minute or so here. We're really happy to have a uh, uh, Dr. Ross uh, Nash here with us from North Carolina. Um, many of you uh, were on the webinar with his wife uh, the other day, uh, Deborah Englehart uh, Nash, and boy, that was well received. Uh, she's offered to do another webinar for us, and we're just looking at time frame when we can do that. Uh, Again, for some of you that were wondering why we're not uh, doing um, a webinar uh, this Friday, we don't have any scheduled. We're actually doing a um, uh, course with Dr. Carl Corner. It's our uh, through our uh, not university, our Washington Academy of General Dentistry. We, we actually are doing a virtual hands-on surgical course. So we've sent out kits to all our participants, and we're going to try this uh, virtually. And it's it'll be interesting to see how it goes. I'm not too sure uh, if there's many people that have done uh, virtual hands-on uh, oral surgery courses before. So. Uh, if that model works, that's probably something we'll look at uh, getting other presenters to do for us down the road. Um, again, you'll see the uh, flyers uh, clicking by. Some of them do not have QR codes on them yet. Uh, uh, that means they just, the registration isn't up on our website yet. Uh, but as soon as we um, get those uh, up on the, the website. We'll put the QR codes on these flyers. Uh, you can always check at www.washingtonag.org and just scroll down and see what course offerings have been added. Um, for those of you that want to see this webinar or share this webinar with others after the fact, go to YouTube, Washington Academy of General Dentistry, and uh, this webinar should be on there within the next day or so. Uh, for those of you that have scheduled uh, to watch the webinar with Dr. Fling that was uh, supposed to occur this afternoon, uh, he's hunkered down somewhere in the hills of uh, Oklahoma there, and uh, he had to reschedule that webinar to this Thursday. 
So if you're registered, uh, we've already sent you an update to the date and time and you shouldn't need to do anything different. Alrighty, it looks like uh, our numbers are there. Uh, everybody's uh, getting into this uh, Zoom webinar. Thank you once again for joining us for our Washington Academy of General Dentistry Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE series. Uh, we'd like to thank the University of Washington School of Dentistry CE for handling the CE credits. CE credits will be emailed to you at the email address you registered with the, uh, over the last uh, couple of days. It will show up in your email uh, inbox in two or three days here. Save a copy of that PDF just in case you need it down the road. Uh, AGD members, you will be uh, seeing those um, CE credits show up on your AGD transcript within two or four weeks uh, time. Uh, keep in mind, you can use any of these QR codes. Here's that email address, agd-covid at Harris Biomedical. Uh, that will allow you to submit questions for Terry Harris tomorrow. Again, Terry Harris has over 3,000 uh, people uh, registered for that Zoom event. We're not sure how um, our Zoom account's gonna handle that. So uh, if for some reason, it crashes on you and you can't get back in, uh, you'll be able to see that webinar. Okay, well with that, I am gonna stop sharing my screen here and I'm gonna ask Dr. Nash to start sharing his. Ah, uh, yeah, I guess bald guys look pretty good. And so. Uh, <laughs> we look really good actually. Yeah. Just, uh, you know what I, I love about your bio? It's nice and short and sweet here. Uh, so I, I'm just going to read this off. Uh, so for those of you that don't know Dr. Nash, uh, Dr. Nash maintains a private general practice in Huntersville, North Carolina, where he focuses on cosmetic, aesthetic, and full mouth rehabilitative treatment. He presents workshops and lectures nationally and internationally on these types of procedures and has authored chapters in two clinical textbooks. Dr. Nash is the co-founder of the Nash Institute for Dental Learning in Huntersville. He is a member and an accredited fellow in the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry. Dr. Nash, thank you very much. And I, I just wanna to emphasize to everybody out there, all our speakers on this series have done this uh, with no honorarium. Uh, a lot of these speakers have uh, seen uh, email threads and reached out to us. And, and thank you, sir, for your wife and you doing that. We really appreciate it. It's our honor. That's for sure. <clears throat> All righty. Go ahead and start sharing your screen. And uh... All right. Now, can everybody see me full, full screen right now? Yeah, and they have the ability uh, in their Zoom, they can focus in just on you too. If they hit up on the upper right speaker view, you okay. fill up the whole screen. All right, so let's see, I shouldn't have pushed the chat there. There we go. Even us old guys can figure out the technology eventually. <laughs> All right, does that look good, Tim? That looks great, thank you. All right. Hey, you, you're a Zoom pro already. I'm doing my best. So, well, listen, um, I am so honored to uh, be one of the speakers that the AGD um, from Washington is, is exhibiting here. Uh, I just really enjoy the AGD, I've been a member for years. But uh, this particular program is, uh, I, I wanna, maybe give you a picture of the most important person on your left. There's my beautiful wife. And uh, you can see she's lecturing at our institute in Huntersville on the lower right there. And then that's me in the upper right. But uh, <clears throat> let, me, let me talk just a little about the history of indirect aesthetics. Um, now, I graduated from Chapel Hill, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill in 1978, when some of you young people weren't even born, I don't think. And, you know, we, I had a nice little general practice going in, in Charlotte uh, in just a, a couple of years. And, you know, we were placing amalgams and, and uh, gold and porcelain fused to metal. Well, uh, aesthetics uh, in dentistry back then was 
we had a little bit of composite, but mostly it was porcelain fused to metal. Uh, of course, gold is as probably every everybody watching this would agree is the best restorative material we have today, but most people don't want that. They want tooth colored materials. Amalgam did a wonderful job and, and still does. However, it's, it's not considered aesthetic by the patients. So in order to get some aesthetics, we discovered that we could fuse porcelain to a metal foundation. A porcelain in itself a, is glass and, and it's not very strong, it's brittle. However, supported a ceramics very, very strong. And the lamination process of fusing it to a metal substrate gave us enough strength to use it even in the posterior. That was aesthetics back then. Maybe uh, we had a few people that might make a full porcelain jacket crown, which were cemented. Most of those broke because uh, you didn't have the additional uh, strength that you get from the adhesive process. But we found out, and, and uh, uh, John Calamia at, at NYU did the studies that you could etch the inside of a porcelain restoration and get the very similar type of micromechanical pattern that you do with etched enamel and started adhering porcelain veneers to two structure back then. That was fantastic. Even though we could make direct composite veneers, porcelain had a more tooth looking surface, uh, stain resistant, a little bit stronger. It was a good thing. But it was felspathic porcelain. Now felspathic porcelain is what we actually, you know, fuse to the metal foundation for porcelain fused to metal. Uh, not very strong in itself, but once it's laminated through the lamination process to an underlying structure, it becomes much stronger. Now we could laminate it to the tooth. So we began placing porcelain veneers. Now they weren't strong, uh, uh, you know, the felspathic porcelain was not strong enough for posterior use without support. So we did, we weren't making inlays and onlays, made a few, but they all broke. Then the manufacturers discovered that you could take that same felspathic porcelain and you could make it stronger by making it uh, pressed, just like you do gold. So they would uh, wax up a, a, a restoration and then we would go ahead and make a mold just like we did with gold. And then in that mold where you burned out the, the uh, 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 the wax, we'd have, we'd have that chamber and they would melt a pellet of ceramic, felspathic porcelain, press it in and it became twice as strong because it was more dense. Now we had a material that we could use even with posteriors. However, the disadvantage was that it required more room, more space, almost a millimeter of space. In fact, you needed seven tenths for the core and then if you wanted to to look nice, you wanted to layer about three tenths of the felspathic material on the surface. So it took more, more preparation. And we used that for several years, but then we got lithium disilicate, which is Emax is the most well-known lithium disilicate, twice as strong as that. So it now is four times as strong as felspathic porcelain. And sure enough, now we could do posterior crowns, we could do onlays, we could do veneers, even anterior bridges, we thought we might be able to do posterior bridges, but really uh, not quite strong enough for maybe maybe one unit of, uh, of bridge work. And everything changed. Of course, now we even have zirconia. Zirconia is eight times as strong as felspathic Portland. Uh, didn't have the, the uh, uh, aesthetics that the other ceramics like Emax and Empress and felspathic uh, but you could layer it just like you do metal. So we had PFZs, porcelain fused to zirconia, and then now we have full contour zirconia. So things have changed to a place that we can restore almost every tooth in the mouth with a ceramic. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. Uh, I'd like to first talk, talk about these fabulous veneers that we can place on people uh to change their smile i have some too these are 20 years old uh porcelain veneers are really marvelous restorations they're most they're beautiful they're tooth like they're stain resistant pretty durable so a lot of people are choosing that 
I get the honor to treat Mrs. South Carolina and Mrs. North Carolina America every year before they go to the Mrs. America pageant. And <clears throat> this was Mrs. South Carolina in 2014. She's a professional golfer, beautiful woman. Uh, and uh, she won the pageant. So when they win the pageant, they come to my office and I'm going to help them with their smile makeover before they go to the national pageant. Now, somebody tell me how I could make this smile more beautiful. She said, okay, Dr. Nash, I'm ready for my porcelain veneers. I mean, look at that. Now, there's one. Can, can you see my pointer here, uh, Timmy? Tim, yes? No, we're not seeing the pointer there. Okay. Her, her right lateral is a ceramic crown that somebody had done for her. It's beautiful. I didn't even know, know it was a crown until I started looking at it. Uh, and then, of course, we took radiographs and that type of stuff. And um, I said, you know, I, I really don't want to cut on your teeth. They're beautiful. I mean, you know, she's got a little bit of a crossbite on that right lateral. But beautiful dental health. And in, in my office, uh, the way I feel about it, if a patient is in good dental health, then they're a candidate for aesthetic dentistry. If she has periodontal disease or active uh, tooth decay, they're not candidates for elective work. We have to treat the disease first. Of course, we're doctors first and artists second. But she had very good dental health. So let me go back to the facial hair. So I told her, I said, look, um, let me try something. I, I really don't want to cut on your teeth. I don't have to. So. Let me take an impression. I'm going to send these to the laboratory and have them make you some no preparation veneers. Now, the reason she probably was a candidate for that is that you can see her teeth are fairly, uh, they draw from mesial to distal. They don't have what we call the belly on them. I'm going to show you in a few minutes. And so, really, I thought I could do this with no preparation. And I had uh, the lab make these thin porcelain veneers. These are Emacs. And there they are uh, photographed on a mirror. And you see how thin they are, etched on the internal surface. We, now, we tried them in, and she loved them. I'm going to go through the try-in phase in a minute. But here's the placement procedure. I'm simply breaking the enamel glaze with a little micro-etcher and, and protecting the adjacent teeth in the etching solution, acid etching. By the way, we have over 900 images here, so don't, don't blink. I have lots of step-by-step. Etch, 10 seconds, rinse. There's that beautiful etch enamel surface we know that we can bond predictably to. Here's the bonding agent. I'm drying the bonding agent and light cure it. Now on the inside of that etched veneer, the lab has, has etched it for me. If they don't, I can etch it with hydrofluoric acid, but they, let, they do that for me. Uh, we place a, a liquid called silane. Silane is a, a chemical which increases the bond between ceramic and composite, maybe 20%. So it's worth using. You just paint it in, let it dwell 20 seconds, dry it off. And then I add my looting agent. And there's, a, there's not a right one. You can use flowable composite. You can use the different looting agents around the country, uh, that, uh, around the world that people make. Uh, that's not the important part. It's a resin. So I'm laying it on the tooth. I, I like a multiple placement technique, as you're going to see. I know some dentists, wonderful dentists, who place these one at a time uh, with warm composite. And it it's, does a nice job. It just takes forever to do that for me. I can place a set of 10 veneers like this in about two hours with the multiple placement technique. So I'm go just going to tack. This is a light here. I'm just going to tack that quickly. And then uh, maybe two seconds with the light. And then I'll take a number 12 blade. And I find a 12 surgical blade is a really good instrument for this. And just peel off the excess. Then I'll go in approximately with a floss and then finish my light cure. Now, there will be some proximal material left when you place one at a time. I mean, excuse me, when you place multiply. Uh, so, Whatever is in there, you need to make sure that you get most of it out with a little carbide burr, which I'll show you in a minute. But whatever's left, you can take one of these interproximal saws. We don't like to call it a saw in front of the patient. We call it interproximal contact achiever. 
and just push that material out. Now, if you have to, if you have to saw and push, stop, you're gonna break something. Take your carbide burr, thin that interproximal out, and then just push the excess out. So the first two are in place. Now again, the uh, right lateral, which you see in the, uh, on the uh, right side of your screen here, uh, is a ceramic crown, beautifully done. You can bond porcelain to porcelain. Now you can't do this to zirconia, but you can do it to feldspathic porcelain or uh, Emacs, which is lithium docilicate. So I'm gonna show you how to do that. I'm protecting the uh, adjacent tissue there with some flowable composite. And then I'm taking hydrofluoric acid, HF. That's what they uh, etch the inside of the porcelain with. But I'm etching that facial surface. About, oh, 30 seconds. Rinse it. And now you can see that frosty surface like you have on the internal surface of your veneer. I'll take and remove the protective layer there. And then I'm going to, whoop, what was that? And then I'm going to uh, place some silane on there. Let it dwell 20 seconds, dry it, just like you do on the internal surface of the, of the veneer. And now I'm gonna treat this just like etched enamel. Bonding agent, like you're in a bonding agent. Add the lutein composite inside the silanated veneer. Put it to place, tack it with the light. Remove the excess, finish the cure. Clean up the proximal. Now what excess you may have at the margins, you can use a carbide finishing burr. This is a little 12 fluted, eight fluted carbide burr. You don't want to use a diamond for this because you can scratch the porcelain. So you want to use a carbide and just lightly remove any excess at the margin. So those three are in place. And now I have all 10. It usually takes 10 veneers on a wide smile like this to cover the smile, sometimes even 12, at least eight. Rarely, rarely do we use six because it just looks like six. You want to take that color around the corner. So here's her new smile. She's very happy with that. It accomplished what she wanted, bigger and this, this way wider. Now the thing about it, if you don't prep the teeth and you're gonna add, these are probably three tenths of a millimeter thick, you're gonna have bigger teeth. So not everybody is a candidate for no prep veneers. Otherwise they, they might have larger looking teeth, but she wanted a little bit broader, a little bit more full and a little bit wider. So it was perfect for her. Beautiful girl. And you can see there is an improvement from right to left. I mean, she was gorgeous to start with. She won the pageant. But now she feels more gorgeous. Uh, with, and she came in, I think, uh, top six in the Mrs. America pageant. So that's no prep. Now there aren't, like I said, not everybody is a candidate for that because I'll show you why in just a minute because you, you've got to have teeth that draw in order to do that. The standard way to make porcelain veneers. And the way most, most of your patients are going to be uh, candidates for are like, with, they need a little preparation. About a half a millimeter <clears throat> on the facial aspect of the central incisor, or actually all the maxillaries, about three tenths on the lower, but I use five, that's a half a millimeter depth cutting diamond. <clears throat> and then I'm going to take, uh, I missed that one. Then I'm gonna take a, a chamfer ended diamond and join those depth cuts at the tissue with a chamfer. Now notice I'm going in approximately. This is this is called the elbow preparation. You want to take that that chamfer into the interproximal just a bit. And also, uh, I by the way, I don't necessarily break the contact. There's nothing wrong if you need to break the contact, if there's a class three or you wanna get the margins further around the corner, but I normally prepare to the contact position. And then I'm gonna take a, a burr and measure about a millimeter and use that, that as a depth cutter. We'd like to have about a millimeter over the incisal edge on a standard porcelain veneer. Those are out of place a little bit. You can see where I'm starting to cut my, my depth cuts there. Sorry, those were 
out of place. Here are my incisal depth cuts. And we want a butt margin, not a chamfer up the lingual. We used to, we used to try to chamfer up the lingual and then you'd have that lap sliding fit. But it find, we found that the incisal edges got really thin and short. So the best margin for an incisal edge we've found is a butt margin like that. Now you don't want any round, uh, any sharp corners. You want everything rounded. So there's a typical porcelain veneer preparation on the standard patient. Half a millimeter facial reduction, a gentle chamfer margin at the tissue level, uh, and bring that chamfer into the proximals with what's called the elbow preparation, a millimeter over the incisal edge with a butt margin and round those proximal corners. This is an example of a patient just like that. She didn't want bigger teeth. She wanted approximately this, the same teeth, but she on um, the same size and shape, but she wanted a better facial appearance, a lighter one, of course. You can see that one lateral incisor on the upper left, her upper left, our upper right, uh, is slightly rotated. Yes, we could easily straighten that with ortho, but we're going to place the veneer anyway, so I decided not to straighten that tooth because then you have to retain it. But you can see she's very healthy. She's a candidate for elective dentistry, no periodontal disease. She's got a little calculus on the lingual of one of those centrals, but otherwise a uh, very, very healthy environment. So I considered she was a candidate for what she wanted and that was upper veneers. So this, these are my depth cuts, half a millimeter. Facial contour, you see I've taken my depth cuts all the way back to the second premolars. Now, of course, where I have that lateral that's rotated, uh, her upper left lateral, our, it's on our right side. We're going to take a little more off the mesial and a little less off the distal, and I'll wrap that one a little bit. Here's my joining the depth cuts with the chamfer into diamond, and then I'm going to make my incisal depth cuts a millimeter to a millimeter and a half, a butt margin. And then notice where I've got the corners right now are, are, are uh, straight. We're going to round those because porcelain likes rounded surfaces, not sharp surfaces. Here's my elbow preparation to the contact. That's a little tiny chamfer diamond that just to refine my margins a little bit. I will take a, a diamond strip and pull through each proximal contact one time if I don't break the contacts uh, with the burr because it's difficult for the lab to identify the proximal margin there unless you have a little tiny space. So I will go ahead and zip that diamond strip there. And then I'm gonna polish everything. I want everything smooth. You don't, you, uh, porcelain likes a smooth surface. Uh, on, on this particular one, where I was not going over the occlusals on the premolars, uh, sometimes it's hard to place those without them being rotated a little bit. So I put what we call uh, little seating grooves in there. Just on the premolars. Everything else is over the incisal edge. So that's pretty typical porcelain veneer preparations for a patient that has good arch form and simply wants a new facial uh, contour surface, whatever. Here's my impression. I'm using a light body and a heavy body in the tray. There's the impression. We're going to take uh, an opposing, of course, bite registration. And I had the laboratory wax up the ideal contours that I wanted and then make a hard model of that wax up. And today, uh, the labs are using, a lot of the labs are using printed models. They're already hard models. And, but uh, if they're using wax, then I duplicate that wax model and then have a vacuform shim uh, pressed over it. And that acts as two functions. One of them, you can make the temporaries with it like this. And then I'll tap those temporaries off and finish the margins. Go back to the tooth, just spot etch one little place, rinse and dry, no bonding agent. I'll use some flowable composite on the internal surface there. 
attach that back to the tooth, clean it up, light cure it. You can actually repair margins or voids with the flowable. So there are her provisionals. Most patients who are getting uh, prepared veneers would like to have some temporary restorations. Now these are more than just temporaries, they're prototypes. Of course, they're all splinted together. Uh, we give each of our patients, let me go back to, yeah, I'll go back to that. Uh, we give each of our patients a Sonicare toothbrush. That's just my favorite mechanical toothbrush. We give them the interproximal cleaners. We give them uh, an entire OxyFresh system of, of toothpaste, gel, and mouthwash. I want them to be able to keep this tissue clean. And again, that is a gift that I give to my patients. It's not for them. Ultimately it is, but it's for me. Because when they come back, I want to take those temporaries off and have tissue that's not bleeding. I'll show you that in just a minute. So then the laboratory fabricates, of course we took impressions and, and as you saw, fabricates the provisionals. The, these particular ones were a real strong feldspathic porcelain. Today I use almost entirely Emacs uh, or lithium basilicate for these. These were beautiful feldspathic, etched on the internal surface. Now here she is, I normally appoint my patients out about three weeks because most laboratories that do this kind of work want about 10 working days. I actually use a lab in California, Frontier Dental Lab. I mean, they're, I, they're one of the best in the country and I'll send them all the way up to California from North Carolina, even though there's lots of labs between here and there because of the quality that they give me con consistently. But anyway, so I give the patient three weeks, they come back in three weeks. Now, she, it's not unusual for them to lose the temporaries on the premolars because they're just hanging out there in space. She lost uh, those, she said, after about a week. And then uh, the, the day before she was coming in, she lost that right canine temporary that, that just broke off. So here's, here's the, uh, how she appeared to me. I tapped those off of there and look at that beautiful tissue. And I actually uh, abraded her tissue there a little bit between the centrals. That's my fault for tapping those off. But that's the way I want my tissue to look because you can work in that environment without cord. Uh, it's just so much more pleasant to do adhesive dentistry when there's not any bleeding. Tried in, I try them in with a drop of water. I've got a little video that I'm gonna show you in a little bit so you can see the live action. But water I find is the best try in medium. Uh, if it looks good with water, then I can use a translucent looting agent. If they want them lighter, then we can use a, a white and opal white. And of course, guess what? She wanted them whiter. Uh, those were B1 shade. I hardly ever get to use B1, which is also 1M1 on the Vita 3D shade guide. And uh, because people want lighter teeth today and B1 looks yellow to them. But this is a B1. We're gonna lighten it up a little bit with a, uh, a looting agent underneath. So anyway, I place all 10 of these at once. Acid etch, just protected the next tooth with a little uh, mire that we sectioned there. Etch 10 seconds, rinse, thoroughly rinse another 10 seconds, and then there's that beautiful etch surface. I sometimes will add a material like Gluma or other desensitizers if I have any dentin at all that's been exposed. And I did in this case, just lightly went over that and, and wet the teeth with the a desensitizer and then suction the excess, and then come back with the bonding agent. Most of us are using seventh generation bonding agents today, which has the etch and the primer in it too, uh, and they work also on etch teeth. So I normally use, my, my favorite one, the, the one I use normally is Bisco's uh, All Bond Universal, and it's seventh generation. But again, that's not critical either, they all work. Saturate the teeth with the bonding agent, uh, air dry it, light cure the bonding agent. In the, on the internal portion of the teeth, we're going to add a drop of silane, let it dwell 20 seconds, dry it, and then add my looting composite. And as you can see, this is a light cured material and it has a white color. So I'll either use translucent or white. Those are the only two colors I use. Placed all these at once, it's light cured, so I had plenty of time. You want to 
take your operatory light off because it'll begin to set it. But uh, this had this particular one by Pentron back then had plenty of working time. And I'll go and <clears throat> hold each one in place with a little instrument that we designed called the veneer stabilizer, which you can get from either uh, Hugh Freedy or uh, also uh, Bis um, Brassler. They both have that. Has a little serrated edge. And I tack each one in place for just a second or two. And then I'm going to go ahead and finish my cure here. 20 seconds per tooth. Now I have a 10 unit splint, as you can see. So the way you remove the excess is with carbide burrs, not diamonds, just light touch, go around with a little eight fluted carbide burr or 12 fluted and remove the excess. Uh, interproximally, the same thing. You'll take that carbide burr into the interproximal facial and lingual and then you should have room, this is a series saw by Dentmat, to just push the excess out. Now I'm using an enhanced cup, a dent supply here to just clean the excess, uh, polish my margins. I'm using a carbide burr on the lingual to remove some excess composite. And then I'll take a, where I, I'll, I'll run some floss in there and if I get a little catch up with the up at the very uh, margin there, I'll take a, this is a gateway strip and go in between, not the contact area, but below that and just clean that off and smooth it. And then polish the proximals with aluminum oxide strips. These happen to be Epitex by GC. They're very thin and it's important to get those polished so you don't have any stain. And that's a typical 10 unit porcelain veneer technique. There's before and after, before on the top, after on the bottom, and her new smile. Now that is very typical. Most patients who are wanting veneers are gonna need that kind of preparation. But isn't there something in between? Yes, there is. For instance, take a look at this patient. She would like to have a better smile. She's actually gonna, uh, was gonna be on television. That's why I'm not showing you her face, but she wanted a prettier smile. And take a look at her maxillary anterior teeth. The centrals are almost square. And as you know, the centrals should be anywhere from 70 to 80% width to length ratio. So they're a little bit square. Also notice the belly, I call them the belly on the proximals. There is not draw from mesial to distal. So you really, can't get a veneer on there and around the corner it's enough to those those gingival margins uh, without taking some tooth structure away. So again, I really don't, these are beautiful teeth, strong teeth. I'm, I'm very conservative. I want to take off as little natural tooth structure as possible. And at this point, uh, I agreed to do some veneers, but I wanted to do minimal prep veneers, almost no prep. So uh, you, you see, that's the kind of color most of our patients want. Oh, M1, the whitest you can get. And her teeth are right now about a B1 shape. So there are my preps. Now, all I did was take a diamond burr and narrow down the proximals until I got draw from mesial to distal. Let me show you compared. That's, that's after I prepped the upper, I think it's eight or 10, 10. And there's, there's before and after the prep. As you can see, very little tooth structure removed, simply making the mesial and distal draw. If I have any indication to move a little facial tooth structure to make that draw better, that's all I do. Now there's no provisionals necessary. That's what, in fact, she liked her teeth better after I prepared them, before, after prep. And of course, now she can get in and clean her floss and when she comes back, that tissue will be healthy. Here are the upper 10 veneers. Emax. And I'm gonna take you through quickly the bonding process here. Here we did six, two and two, so acid etch, rinse. There's that beautiful etch surface. Here's the bonding agent, saturate the tooth with the bonding agent, thin it out with the 
air, light cure the bonding agent, silanated veneers. This happens to be choice two uh, by Bisco, and it is a little lighter color, as you can see, opal white. I place all six of these. I, now you can actually take, as you're holding them in place with some kind of an instrument like the veneer stabilizer, uh, they will begin to gel if you put the operatory light on. Okay, that, so that gives them that little bump cure. Uh, you can also wave cure them. So I just get them to a point where I can start removing some excess and then I finish the cure. Excess removed with the carbide burr. Now, I did get a little bit of uh, material glazed onto that first premolar, so I'm taking a carbide burr just to remove that excess. So I can go back to the tooth and get a bonding agent. Removing some on the lingual with a carbide burr, proximal floss I was able to get in here with, without the, the interproximal saw. And then I place the premolars. The same fashion, etch, bonding agent, Cure the bonding agent, add your looting composite, tack it cured, remove excess, and finish the cure, the cure. And then the same thing on the other side. Carbide bird, remove excess. Now there's it's very likely, especially when you're increasing in size or length like this one, that you're gonna have a little bit of of interocclusal adjustment, interoral adjustment. And I'm using a fine diamond and a, another fine diamond after that, and then a 30 bladed carbide finishing burr, and then pour some polishing points. That will be smoother than glazed when we get the adjustment done. And then an enhanced cup, proximal polishing, and there's the final result right after bonding them to place. We routinely have our patients back two to three weeks after uh, we place a case like this for a complimentary follow-up in Profi. And uh, I make sure that all the margins are clear, tissue's healthy, adjustments can be made. So that's, that's part of the treatment. And then of course, that's when I take my final pictures and you can see how beautiful that tissue responded. So minimal prep. No provisionals necessary. No whack, no pre-op wax up necessary. So it saves a lot of time for you and the patient. And, but again, not everybody's a candidate for this. Most people need more preparation than this. Before, prep, and after. Before and after. Now, I, and on this one, it's a very similar case, but I wanna introduce one other thing to you here. And I have a video so you can see some live action here. But this particular patient, I'm gonna look at her, she's got a beautiful smile, but she just doesn't feel it's beautiful. She wants porcelain veneers for that purpose. And I, I can see some improvement. You can see her right canines tipped in a bit and the laterals in front and or maybe the laterals could be a little bit longer, some minor, but I, I sure her smile is very nice the way it is. However, look below and you'll see some crowded teeth. Now, what I have found is that if I have a patient with crowded teeth, I'm gonna illustrate this with another case or two, uh, that if I straighten the lower teeth first, I don't get the chipping on the incisal edges. Haven't you seen that? Patients come in and they've got some chipped incisal edges on the maxillary and and you put some bonding on there and you repair it and it comes back, they're chipped again, it continues. And you look below it, very often you have mandibular teeth that are malaligned. And if you straighten those teeth, I find very little chipping on the opposing. So there's a, there's a, a uh, system that I've started using a number of years ago and it's called the Inman Aligner. It's only for anterior teeth like this, canine to canine nothing posterior and it's got to be no more than three millimeters of crowding if you've got three millimeters or less of crowding like this 
in a matter of weeks with this particular material invented by Don Inman of Inman Ortho Lab in, in Florida, uh, you could straighten those teeth in a matter of weeks, not months, not year, matter of weeks. And it's, it's just wonderful to, to help me in my restorative procedures. You see here, it has a, a lingual bar that pushes, it's a spring activated, pushes against the lingual, and then it's got a facial bow that pulls against the facial. So it basically squeezes the teeth together and you have to do some IPR in a proximal reduction. The thing about it is that's one device. It's not a series of devices. I, I, I have once in a while, we use some Invisalign uh, and that takes a number of several trays. This is one device, all of the power, uh, the, the the uh, uh, forces are built in because that is made around a printed model of their straightened teeth. So they're all built in. One tooth moves, it picks up another one. It's called an Inman aligner. And in a matter of about six weeks, I was able to straighten those teeth for most patients choose a wire retainer because you do have to retain them. You can also use an Essex. She chose the wire, bonded wire. And that was a good start because I have never had any chips in her new restorations. So again, here she is before, and you can see the lower, on the, on the lower right there, uh, her lower teeth have been aligned so that our maxillary teeth can be built better. She, again, wants a bleach shade. So here's my, uh, Preparation. I'm just taking a fine diamond and I'm helping the teeth draw, taking a little bit of facial bulk. No anesthetic necessary, by the way. Some patients want it, but there's no anesthetic necessary for this. She has no anesthetic. I'm simply contouring the teeth to get rid of any um, areas of the teeth that are bulky or that don't draw from mesial to distal. All I'm doing there is beveling the incisal edges just a bit and rounding the corners. I'll take my diamond strip proximally and then polish everything with the enhanced cut. So those are my preps. No temporary is necessary. She frankly liked her teeth better after the prep. And OM1. Sorry about that. There's her posing impression. The models, the impressions, uh, the models of the uppers and the veneers made from the laboratory. Photographed on the mirror, you can see how thin they are. All right. So I'm gonna take you through, there she's back. You see that beautiful tissue on the upper? I actually, you can see on the lower, uh, there's a little bit of information uh, distal to the one canine and lateral, and I'm just helping her floss better there. We have to give her the tools to do it. But the upper, look how healthy that tissue is. And we're ready to play. So this is my video. It is sped up pretty fast, so I'm just gonna show you, there's my, Put a drop of water, try them in with a drop of water. The try in is make sure everything fits and that she likes the way they look and that I like the way they look too. She loved them, so we're gonna go. Here I placed, uh, protected the adjacent teeth uh, behind the laterals with a little, um, Toffelmeyer, rinse. There's that beautiful edge surface. It's the bonding agent. I wish I could work this fast. Like here, the bonding agent. Silenate the veneers with the looting composite. all in place. That's my little veneer stabilizer instrument. It has a little serrated uh, edge that helps me hold those to place. 
move my strips, continue to let them stay in place. I've got the operatory light now I'm gonna place on there to help gel that material a little bit and they'll begin to stay in place. You see, it's already starting to gel. And then I'll actually take my light and just do a wave and then finish cleaning off excess that I can get at this point. And then finish the light cure. Carbide finishing burr, and also I'm getting getting the flash off the next tooth. Remove gingival proximal any excess material. I'm using just a small mosquito dime in there again to get rid of any flash on the adjacent canine, and then we'll place these three on the right. So it was four, three, and three in this case. There's that beautiful edge surface, bonding agent. Try it, light cure it. and add my veneers. Same process. and finish my cure. So it's basically one, two, three, anteriors than both proximal surfaces. Again, with this technique, I can place 10 restorations like this in under two hours. Removing excess, looting resin, Now, again, she had no anesthetic here to place these or to prep. But this is called EMLA, E-M-L-A. It's prilocaine and xylocaine. And you can get this at any of your dealers. Very strong topical. So in order to help me finish the proximals without making her discomfort, just uncomfortable, uh, that topical does a good job. Number 12, surgical blade. I don't think I could live without in, that instrument. You can remove little tiny pieces in approximately. And then of course, we're gonna check the occlusion and make any minor adjustments with fine diamonds. And we'll use a 30 bladed finishing burr. This is actually Harold Hyman's uh, technique that he developed for polish, adjusting and polishing Cirax when they first came out. And you take it uh, through this process, that's the 30 bladed carbide finishing burr after the two fine diamonds. And then you'll take porcelain polishing points or cups or wheels and finish that surface 
and it is smoother than glazed porcelain, so it's not going to be abrasive to opposing teeth. Anytime you adjust ceramics in the mouth, that process should be done and it, they should be highly polished and they are not abrasive that way. That's an enhanced cup. Again, Densify is very, very uh, useful tool to polish margins and clean excess off the surface. So there she is just after placement. And you can see a little tissue inflammation, but not much. Here she is two, two weeks later. before and after, preps and after. So another example, now this is more common. Someone who would like to have porcelain veneers to correct or enhance her smile on the maxillary arch. And I, I agree with her, that's a good, a good uh, procedure I think for her since she has incisal edges that are chipped and one dark lateral incisor. But look below, and you see the chips on the central incisors? Yeah, that is what I see when I find crowded lower teeth. And I explained to her just what we talked about before, that if I straighten those lower teeth, that I can get a better result on what she's wanting, and that's maxillary veneers, and she agreed. So again, we use the Inman liner on this. And if you go back and look, uh, we're going to move not only that one central that is facially inclined, but the, t the, la the other central uh, on, the, on the right side, on your left side, and the other lateral that is also leaned back a little bit. Can you see that B behind the canine? So those three teeth are gonna be moved in a matter, this is about eight or nine weeks. She comes to see me every two weeks and I do a little bit of IPR that is, by, by the way, when I get uh, these uh, tools, this, this aligner back from uh, the uh, Inman Aligner Lab, Don Inman, uh, it's called Inman Ortho Lab. Uh, they actually have a prescription telling me exactly how much to IPR to do and where and when and where to put the buttons. It's amazing, pretty easy actually. So just again, in a matter of a couple of months, we were able to straighten those lower teeth. And notice how the tissue also looks better. You'll see that in the before and afters. Now it's not perfect, but now I can take some, a diamond and do some enameloplasty and have some very good occlusal edges there, inside the edges. So here's the wax up from the laboratory for our upper restorations. That is the clear stent that I had to make over the duplicate of that wax up. It actually is, is useful as a prep guide too. I'll show you that in a minute. There's the color she wants, OM2. You can see that my central lateral canine and two premolars are already prepared on her left side, our right side, we're looking at it. And the depth cuts have been placed in the other side. Everything has been prepared. I did go around the linguals on the right lateral and central to make what we call a little 360 design because remember those lateral incisors, uh, uh, that lateral and central were tipped in and now they're brought, were brought out and I need a little bit of a room there uh, for the new contact surface. So on the uh, central and lateral incisor, there's a 360 design and we're gonna talk to you more about those in a minute. The rest of those our standard porcelain veneers. Here's my prep guide in place. Here is the provisional, um, excuse me, the uh, impression, the opposing impression, the bite registration. Now, these are the temporaries. Now, you can call those temporaries, but they're really prototypes. They need to look good. It's very encouraging to the patient uh, that they leave with provisionals, uh, prototypes that look very similar to what they're gonna get. 
If there are changes we make in those, we're gonna communicate that to the laboratory. I rarely have to do that. So those are her provisionals. These are the restorations made in the laboratory. And you can see I've got 360 design on the lateral and central, and the rest of those are facial veneers over the incisal edge. In this picture, I have the two, the two central switch there on that mirror. There. So you can see I have uh, the, the 360s should be side by side, but that's the way they look before. Here she is back and I tap those off and that's the way I want my tissue to look. I tap my, uh, my temporaries off like that. You get, sometimes you have to section them. You can take a back action crown tapper and, and they'll come off maybe in pieces. But uh, my assistant will look over and say, it's gonna be a good day, Dr. Nash. If I have bleeding and I have to control that, I, it, we can still do it, but it's not as much fun. You have to control the hemorrhage here. I didn't even need to use cord. So here's everything, the upper 10 in place. The four on the upper two and the lowers of the afters. But you can see that just a little bit of tooth movement on the lower allowed me to get a much better result on the maxillary arch. And in fact, these have been in, in my patient's mouth eight, about eight years now, never the first chip on those edges. Had I left the lowers crowded, it's very possible uh, that she would get chipping. Just like this lady, I'm gonna take a look. Maxillary centrals are chipped, aren't they? And look below, they're crowded teeth. Almost inevitably, that's what I find. So we straighten the lowers in a matter of a couple of months with the Inman aligner. She chose a wire retainer rather than an Essex, most people do, and a little edge bonding. So the mandibulars now are ready to build some porcelain against. Now, of course I could straighten these too, but knowing that I am gonna be applying porcelain, if you uh, move teeth and, and with an adult, especially, you've gotta retain them. That's all there is to it, that they're gonna relapse. So we wanted those to be stable where they are, and there are my preparations. On the lateral incisor, uh, on, the, on your upper right or upper left, you can see I, I ran around to the lingual to create some lingual contour. You'll see that in a minute. And there they are in place. Again, never the first chip on those incisal edges for this patient who's still in my practice. All right, now you'd heard me talk about a 360 laminate, 360 degree laminate, it, that's a crown. But I really call them laminates because these are so thin. Let me show you, this patient, this is a number of years ago. I might choose to straighten those lowers today, but she wanted veneers on lowers and uppers, maxillary mandibular. So again, if I don't move them, they're stable there, uh, I don't have to retain them. But as you can see, she's got kind of a class three deep overbite and there's lots of function on the facial aspect of those mandibular incisors against the lingual surface of the maxillary incisors. Here's her lateral guidance and the maxillary view. So in her case, I prepared the lowers for veneers and then also prepared the uppers for veneers. However, you can also see, I took that margin all the way into the proximal and around to the lingual and removed maybe a half a millimeter or two structure there. So it have some room. That I call a 360 degree laminate. Now, of course you can call those crowns, but crown, there are very few uh, conventional crowns that could that, that would not need more reduction than that. So those are really almost completely in enamel. Impressions. These are the provisionals we made for her. And again, they're really prototypes because they give 
us some information. We've changed the uh, incisal length. We're talking about that's where you make your F's and S's. So if we, if she starts to whistle, we know we need to shorten them. And, and the provisionals, the prototypes, give us a lot of information. But you can see how thin these are, but they're, they go all the way around the teeth. So that's why I call those 360 degree laminates. Here's just a few weeks later, beautiful tissue. As I remove those provisionals and then we bond them to place. But you can see now I have porcelain against porcelain in this functional path, which means less potential for wear of the natural tooth structure and I have control over my guidance. Here's the canine guidance that's called crossover. Canine guidance. And there's her new smile. And here's before and after. And before on the top, after on the lower. So I use 360 laminates a lot when I am placing veneers on upper and lower teeth. All right, here's another, you only see a few faces here, but these are some of my beauty queens. This actually was Mrs. North Carolina, 2019. Now, she's a beautiful woman already. Uh, she had breast cancer. Her, her platform was breast cancer awareness. She won the North Carolina pageant and then came to my office for a smile makeover. I believe that that incisal wear was from the stress of her breast cancer and the treatment that she had to go through for it. Because look at the rest of her teeth, beautifully healthy. OM1 is what she's looking for. So here's my preoperative models. And we asked the lab to do full wax ups on the upper 10 and lower 10. We had them duplicate that into a hard model and did the vacuform shims, which act as a prep guide. Now, this is the way we make our provisionals today. I'm gonna to take you through that step by step before we finish today. Uh, but this is the way we make them mostly because that uh, polyvinyl laboratory putty was made over the wax up, the shape that we wanted. Same thing on the mandibular. Notice how we sculpt around the teeth, and I'm going to show you that a little bit later. This is my uh, little suck down shim that's made over the model of the wax up, and you can see that they become a prep guide. You can also give those to the patients and they fit over the provisionals. So they act as a night guard. And then the same thing with the maxillary. You can see I've got one crown I'm replacing in here. We're gonna talk about onlay veneers pretty soon, but there's the, the uh, plastic shim over the top. I did find some decay in the mesial of the first molar on your left side, her right side, so I did to uh, design that for an inlay. We're gonna talk about the onlay veneers on the next two teeth there in a little bit. Bite registration, provisionals in place with the shade guide in front. I, and by the way, I, I use the, this photography to communicate with the laboratory. Uh, they see, they get a picture of this or a digital picture and they, they can re really helps them know where they're going as far as shade goes. These are the provisionals a couple of weeks later. And then we're gonna tap those off and put these on. These were made at Frontier Lab, by the way, in California, beautiful job. And here they are in place. another top six for Mrs. America.
I've had two runner-ups, first runner-ups, uh, a number in the top six, and she's one of them. She actually, after she won the Mrs. North Carolina pageant, uh, her breast cancer came back and she had to have a double mastectomy. And uh, she went to the Mrs. America pageant and still came in top six. She's quite a lady, I have to tell you. Now, does anybody think you could close this space without orthodontic treatment? You know, ortho would be best, but can you imagine how long it would take to bodily move both those centrals together? I'm saying year and a half. I don't know, not an orthodontist. But you can tip teeth pretty quickly. You can rotate them, but moving those roots bodily, moving the entire root, takes a long time. He's not interested in that. He wants to know if I can close that space. Well, I have one, by the way. See, Not quite as wide as his. Mine's closed with porcelain. And yes, you can. However, you have to consider some proportions. I could do something to close the space between those centrals, but they'd look like shovels, so they'd be huge. You've got to look at the golden proportion that Leonardo da Vinci discovered in nature and in our human bodies. And that's the one to 1 1.6 ratio. The lateral, you take the lateral and the width of the lateral, the centrals should be about 1.6, 1.8, but 1.6 times the width of the lateral looking from the facial and the central from the mesial to the facial line angle or the cusp tip should be 0 0.6, 0 0.61, 1.6. So if you have that proportion, even though the teeth may be too big for the patient's mouth, they look right. So it takes more than just two teeth. And as you can see here, uh, I'm going to need to remove some distal uh, uh, of material off the centrals, maxillary centrals, and add to the mesials of the laterals to do that. So we're looking at the shade we're looking for. It's OM3. Now, you, here are my preparations. I call again those 360 laminates on the centrals. Hardly any preparation on the mesial at all, except to determine a margin. But I did have to reduce the centrals so that I could build out the mesial of the laterals. Two 360 laminates, and then the lateral incisors are veneers. We actually decided, uh, I was going to try to do this with four, but we decided to add some no prep veneers on the mesial aspects of the canines also. There's his little prep guide in place so I can evaluate my preparations. Here are his provisionals. We're going to go through that step by step in a few minutes. Again, they need to look good. They need to be prototypes. And again, here, here are the restorations from the laboratory. Now, the reason that I want lingual coverage on the centrals is so that I have support from the lingual uh, for that cantilever, those two cantilevers we built out there. If, if I just hang porcelain out in the, in the air like that, it's more likely they're going to break. I want some support from the lingual. That's why we went with 360 laminates there. So, remove the provisionals, bond in the restorations. And you know the process now, same thing you've seen me do time and time again. So now, again, just even, but those centrals are a little wider than normal. Uh, they do, they still have the about 80% width to length ratio, and that's, that's another thing you want to look at. But they look right because they're in the golden proportion. before and after. Smile before and after. Hold in proportion. And then this one, 
you can see, but actually I've got this uh, where it'll just fade in here and you'll see that it's got that proportion. So it usually takes six teeth to close a space that large. All right, my passion is anterior aesthetics, but I also enjoy posterior aesthetics. Uh, when we found that we could have ceramics that are strong enough for posterior occlusal use, then we, we start placing a lot of them. Uh, Emacs is what I use routinely for these types of restorations. I do very few inlays. I think I can compete with an inlay with a direct composite, but the preparation is certainly if you've ever placed any gold, you know, with gold, you want bevels all around the margins. You want kind of uh, straight uh, line angles. It's okay to have sharp angles. Uh, you have to have some retention design, about 77% uh, um, can't on the thing. So, but these are much easier. You do need a millimeter and a half to two over uh, the isthmus, if you, if you leave that too thin, both down and, and across, that's where it may break. So you need to be sure you get that. And then rounded internal line angles and no bevels. You don't want any bevels on these. So that's where they might break. If you go over any occlusal surfaces, and most of the time that I'm placing indirect restorations like this in the posterior, it's, it's replacing a cusp or two or three or four. Uh, you want that millimeter and a half to two millimeters of clearance. You can even replace all four cusps if you like. And you say, Ross, why don't you just crown the tooth? Well, look where my margins are and look how much more tooth structure I have left uh, by placing less than full coverage. So this is a, a dentist friend of mine that in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. He, he went to my our, our first continuum. I don't know if you know this, but uh, Larry Rosenthal and Bill Dickerson and I started the first aesthetic continuum in the country, and I think it was back about 1990. Can't remember the exact date, but there weren't any of these continuums around the country like I have at the National Institute now, and Deborah and I have. Uh, they were, you know, Baylor was teaching some, and that's where Larry and Bill and I met up, and we're all teaching courses for them. And Larry called me one day and he said, Ross, nobody's teaching this outside of a dental school and everybody's interested. Let's put together a continuum. It's called the Ultimate Aesthetic Practice. It was uh, three courses, just like I have now, direct, indirect, and full mouth. Then we went on to live patient after that. And uh, they were very successful. I mean, we had 40 seats with a waiting list every month. It was amazing. Of course, then uh, Bill decided to start LVI and he, he focused his attention there. And Larry and I continued to run the, net, the, uh, uh, the ultimate aesthetic practice there in New York and at NYU uh, for another year or so with Deborah at doing our practice management. And then uh, they, the lab that I had, the America's lab back then, closed their lab in, in Manhattan and moved out to Queens and we didn't have that beautiful teaching facility that they had anymore. So Larry decided to start the Aesthetic Advantage programs, which he has live patient uh, treatment programs, and Deborah and I started the Nash Institute. That's how that all happened. Anyway, Bill, uh, this, this uh, friend of mine, he said, Raleigh, that's him. After the first program, he called me and said, Ross, would you replace my amalgams for me? So I said, sure. These are his amalgams. And I said, Bill, how long you had those, man? He said, oh gosh, probably 15, 20 years. Look at them. I said, you know this is elective, don't you? And he says, I know, but I want white, just like my patients. So I don't necessarily replace amalgams like that if my patients have them and are perfectly happy with them. I think they, I mean, they're doing fine. Uh, amalgam actually expands, you know, when it, when it cures. So inside that, and you put little undercuts in there. So, and they corrode, they're, they're antimicrobial. They weren't a bad material, they were a good material. However, composite uh, shrinks when it cured. So we have to take care of that space. And that's, that's the difference, it has to be done well. But I think done well, they can be excellent restorations. And that's what he wanted. So here's my preparations, uh, no bevels, uh, one and a half to two millimeters of clearance, rounded internal line angles, 
These were some direct temporaries I used back then. I normally use bisacrylic and cement them with Duralon uh, today rather than a direct temporary. Here are the models. This is, we would use Emacs every day for this today. Move the provisionals, try in the restoration. Now you can't make your adjustments until they're bonded in because remember the lamination process supporting that ceramic gives it its ultimate strength. So until it's bonded to place, it's not gonna have its ultimate strength and you can break these if you try to have the patient tap and adjust here. So we gotta adjust them after they're in place. That's why you want a really good lab and you wanna do your part well and have the right amount of clearance and everything so you don't have to do a lot of adjustments on those. Silane on the internal surface, etch, rinse. Now you can use selective etch here and just etch the enamel and use seventh generation bonding agent. At this time I was doing total etch. And there's the bonding agent. I use a dual cure. On veneers, I almost always use a light cure. Sometimes I'll use a dual cure. But anytime we have onlays, anything more than a millimeter thick like this, we're going to use a dual cure looting agent. And I'll put these to place. Now, rather than try to clean all that up right now, I just hold these in place until it begins to gel, which is maybe 60 seconds. And then you just peel off the excess and run to in the interproximal with some floss. And then I'll go ahead and it will cure on its own because it's a dual cure. Uh, the one I use most of the time is, is uh, Bisco's dual link, but they're all good. And then I'm going to cure that surface just so I can go ahead and finish. Now those are the kind of adjustments I want to make if I have to make any, hardly any. So we, and there's nothing I hate worse than putting in a beautiful onlay and then cutting all the anatomy way to get the teeth together. So I want to do my part right. I want to have a really good lab to make restorations like that. So onlays, I do a lot of partial coverage restorations in my practice. Let me show you what people are looking for. Total aesthetics. This, this patient uh, was actually, uh, I had never seen her before. And when she came in, she told me she'd always been perfectly happy with her porcelain fused to metal crowns that you see uh, on her canine, lateral, and both central until she saw her best friend's smile that was done in our office. Now she's not satisfied anymore. So she wants a smile makeover too. Normally, again, smile normally ends at the second premolar, sometimes the first molar. You can get by with eight, usually go 10, maybe 12. She chose 10 and you can see she's got some amalgams over there and she's got a, a crown on your right, her, her left on her first premolar and then pour some fused metal crowns in the anterior. Well, if you, if you look at uh, Iva Clark's recommendations and this was actually for Empress back then, today I've used Emacs, uh, that's the design that they'd like to see. At least a millimeter to millimeter and a half on the facial, millimeter and a half on the lingual clearance, uh, over the incisal of the edge, same thing, millimeter and a half to two. And I actually like a rounded uh, uh, chamfer margin rather than a butt margin. That's what they recommended. But took those old crowns off. And I'll be darned if that's not the prep I had. So I had everything I needed. And then I prepared the, uh, the other lateral. Now, where we have these amalgams, I could place almost no prep veneers on the facial aspect of those premolars and bring them out facially. But then I have the amalgam and it sometimes comes through as gray. And I, I think you can see that first premolar looks like it could use replacing. It's got a little fracture right in the middle. It's hard to see there. So we decided rather than to just place veneers on that, we're going to restore more of the tooth. Now these I call onlay veneers. We're going to prepare the tooth for the facial veneer, whatever we're going to do, sometimes none, because we might want to bring it out further. Then we're going to remove the amalgam or decay or old composite and make our preparation in the proximal, maybe a MO, maybe a D, MOD or DO. And then I'm going to connect both of those with a millimeter and a half over the incisal edge and join them all together with a rounded shoulder margin. We call those onlay veneers. They're basically three quarter crowns. 
However, pretty darn conservative in preparation. Uh, when you can say, Ross, now that's the stamp cusp on the lingual layer, aren't they gonna break that cusp? They, when we were doing gold onlays like this, we would actually cover that cusp because we didn't want to break. But I can't remember, I've done thousands of these, and I can't remember a single lingual cusp that has broken off. It probably has, but I just can't remember it. That's how rare it is. Um, the entire onlay would come off. I, I am convinced the dentin bonding, at least in the past, did deteriorate with time, and that's a lot of dentin there. Uh, and you could just re cement it. But can you imagine how much tooth would have been left on that second premolar had I prepared that for a crown? Maybe hardly anything to bond to. I would have had to maybe put some pins or endo on a post. But now with that lingual cusp there, and as long as it's supported by dentin, I usually keep it, uh, I've got something to bond to. So those are called onlay veneer preparations on the premolars. And then of course I've got the other side. I had planned to veneer both the lateral and the canine, but that lateral incisor doesn't look like it, but that uh, class three went way deep into the two. So I decided to do a, a crown prep there. However, on the canine, I am going to prepare a veneer. Now, uh, again, these were Ivy Clark's recommendations for Empress and the posterior, and you can see the, the same dimensions. So my uh, premolar, my first premolar, yeah, I put a little build up in there and prepared that for a crown. And then the other one is an onlay veneer because I, I actually found that there was some decay on both sides of that. So I've made that an onlay veneer, but you can see how much more aggressive Empress uh, veneers were on the canine there than now uh, the, the Emacs, it doesn't have to be that aggressive. So you can see I've got a lot of dentin there. So they're my upper and lower preps. I'm gonna take my impressions, make these are the provisionals, cemented. And again, they're prototypes. I want her to be happy when she leaves. If she sees something in my provisionals that she doesn't like, I want to know now because I can communicate that with the laboratory. And it gives, today I would use Emacs every time these were a material like Empress. But this is what people are looking for today. This kind of aesthetics. Porcelain fused to metal just usually doesn't stack up to this. Before and after. All right, let me show you how we fabricate these prototype provisionals. We want to start with a good set of study models. And I, I take a face bow. I happen to like the DNR system. Uh, send it to the laboratory. They mount them for me. And then you'll wax up. So over the wax up, we are going to fabricate a putty stent. Now this is a uh, base catalyst. A little cigar, put it over the, I, I like to take it on the palatal, on the maxillary arch for a seating. So there's the, imp basically an impression of my wax up. Now I'll go ahead and Again, today they normally make, or, or a lot of them are making these out of the uh, printed plastic model, so you don't have to do this part. But if you're going over the wax up, I'm going to pour and make me a model of that wax up right in that impression that I just made. And th then we're going to, on those hard models, I'll make my vacuum, vacuum form shim suck down model. Uh, plastic stent. That's going to act as my, my um, 
prep guide and I give it to the patients that fit over the temporaries and they can use them as a night guard. Now I'm gonna go ahead and reline those so I can get a real good, I read the, I go back on the, on the wax, wax um, the wax up with the same one, and, except I want real accurate contour. So I'll put a light body in there and reline it. And then take my 12 blade or 15 blade and trim it around and, and trim it around the teeth. Okay, now I used to do it just straight across the top and you'd have excess you'd have to cut off. I'll show you in a minute. But if you do this part and cut a little hole in the palate back there, trim around the teeth and cut a hole in the palate and you'll find that when you put your bis acrylic on, look on the right uh, hand screen here, all the acrylic that normally goes on the palate, bis acrylic, is in that little hole right there. So it's a lot less cleanup for you. So here's an example of the pre-op. Here are my preps. You see my prep guide over the preps on the lower right. Here I'm making my provisionals. Just uh, tease this excess away from the margins and then take it off. And you see you have very little cleanup to do. You do it with a carbide burr and make sure they can clean it approximately. You see on the lower left is how it used to look before we started sculpting around the teeth and we have had to cut all that off with the carbide burr. So you can tell it's just much more efficient today. Here are her provisionals on the, all these are pictures of her provisionals at uh, three weeks. See how healthy that tissue is. You can take a back action crown tapper and sometimes it'll come off in one piece. It usually breaks. And that tissue is in pretty decent shape. And we're going to bond these restorations in. So that's the way we make our provisional. It's basically sucked down and we leave it on there. It's called a shrink wrap. Here's another example. Patient that wanted maxillary restorations for aesthetic reasons. Here's the pre-op model, the wax up. There's the wax up. Here's our stent for provisionals. That is a copy, a hard model of the uh, wax up with the suck down shims built over them. Preps, prep guide. You can see I've got some on veneers prepared on hers. Bite registration, impression. This is Kettenbox impression material with the extra light body around the margins. And I like the putty, uh, the soft putty uh, in the heavy body because it actually helps force that material down into the sulcus. It's hard to miss the impressions. And then of course, the provisionals. We'll clean that up. And there are her temporary slash prototypes. Restorations. In place. There will be four preps. All right, we talked about porcelain fused to metal restorations before, and they were wonderful, and they still are good restorations. They do require 
some significant tooth preparation because you have to have room for metal and you have to opaque the metal and then the aesthetic porcelain. So they're pretty aggressive as far as uh, preparation goes. Gold, all you need was a millimeter, but it's all gold. Well, the porcelain, you can take the, this wonderful zirconia oxide. It's not, it, zirconia is a metal uh, on the periodic chart, but zirconia oxide is what we're using. It's the oxide of that metal. metal. So it is a ceramic, but it's as strong as most metals. Very, very strong ceramic. And you can fuse porcelain to that just like you did porcelain fused to metal. The preparation is almost identical. Heavy sham for margin at a millimeter, a uh, millimeter and a half to two face lingual and occlusal preparations with rounded corners. Let me show you uh, a case that we decided to use a PFZ on porcelain fused to zirconia. This patient looks like she doesn't have much wrong with that tooth, but that little tiny hole went into a big MOD and I did a buildup in there. So that is a typical PFZ preparation that we just talked about. Uh, it could also be a PFM preparation. I don't get to use A2 shade very often. This patient wanted that to blend in with what her natural teeth are, so I got to use a real color for once. There's the, and, and this is the porcelain fused of zirconia. I mean, they're just, it's hard, it's hard to compete with that when you have a metal foundation and opaque on that metal and then the porcelain. Here, there's no opaque needed and the underlying structure is aesthetic. Now here it is in place. You can cement these or bond them. I tend to bond them, but you wanna have a, uh, retention resistance form just like any other crown preparation, not, not counting on the adhesive dentistry to hold this in. It is a little bit high in value. Can you see that? It's a little bit light, uh, but she really liked it. And you know who wins? She wins, the patient wins, because uh, when they're happy, I'm happy. I could go back and change that and make it darker and then she wouldn't like it. She is tickled with this. So uh, that's her crown, it's a beautiful crown. You can also use zirconia in a full contour method. That's, you know, uh, Glidewell calls these bruxers, full contour zirconia. It's the strongest, doesn't need as much preparation because there's no layering porcelain. Uh, doesn't quite have the aesthetics though. It's a little bit more opaque, although the newer ones are coming out do have some translucency. You lose a little bit of strength, but not much. But let me show you an example of, of two teeth that we were going to be doing crowns on. I'm Use an antimicrobial gel there, clean it up. I will put a little base. There's a couple of those on the market, not dical, uh, not uh, calcium hydroxide, but instead uh, calcium silicate. Uh, I just said calcium hydroxide. Uh, it's not calcium hydroxide, but calcium silicate. And uh, uh, one of them on the market is like Theracal, which will do the same thing as Dical did. And then I'm using a, after I put bonding agent on there, seventh generation, I'm using a flowable composite buildup material here. So there's my preparation. This one is full contour zirconia. There's no layering porcelain. The thing that happens with the uh, PFZs is the same thing as PFMs, P porcelain fused metal. Uh, what chips is the layering porcelain. Here, there is no layering porcelain. Not quite as aesthetic, but again, it's a beautiful restoration and very, very strong. So full contour zirconia. Usually second molars, that's what I'm going for today, if I'm gonna do a crown. You can also make bridge work. Now this was a patient that needed a three unit bridge or chose that instead of an implant crown. And we made that with porcelain fused to zirconia. and it's strong enough to function. You can also use this technology for Maryland bridges. A Maryland bridge was a good idea because it allowed you to attach a, a tooth there on the lingual with the metal foundation uh, wings to hold on to uh, the adjacent teeth. And 
didn't have to crown the teeth. This is back before implants and things like that. So uh, it was a conservative way to add a lateral incisor or any other missing tooth. <clears throat> but they really didn't have the aesthetic because of the metal. Well, now we can take the same technology and we can make our wings and our foundation with zirconia oxide. And then that's like a PFZ. And we have some materials that will bond these fairly well to the teeth. Now, they sometimes come off, but you can replace them. It's, it's a conservative way to go. So I'm etching, placing some uh, dual cure looting agent on the inside of the uh, wings that have been uh, treated with something called Z prime, which is a primer for zirconium that, that uh, they have from Visco. So PFC, Maryland Bridges, uh, the orthodontists, uh, 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 local orth orthodontist, uh, Dave Paquette, famous guy, has sent me a number of his patients that are missing laterals and they're not quite grown, not ready for implants, et cetera. And we've used these on them. All right, let me show you a combination case. This lady wanted to smile. You can understand why she's already been through orthognathic surgery and ortho and a whole lot in her life. Uh, she has significant problems and she's in pretty good shape right now. And now she wants some aesthetics, but one of her lateral incisors, as you can see, has had endo. And even though that looks like a radiolucency, that is solid, it's been there for years and years. And her dentist has just said, let's just watch it. So I said, okay, I'll go ahead and take a chance. And we made her some Emacs crowns. And sure enough, that new crown root ratio caused that lateral to start getting mobile. So I sent her over to my periodontist friend and he placed a beautiful implant there. And we replaced that. Now I didn't charge her anything for my end of it. He charged uh, chased, uh, charged free implant because I took the chance with her. Uh, this is a, a material that I placed inside. It's a, actually a composite that sits in a rubbery state, so I don't have to use a cotton pellet or anything else in there. And then cemented that. So we have all ceramic crowns and an implant crown. And in the anterior, I like to use zirconium abutments because they're more aesthetic. Although sometimes, you can see that. We have a case like this where a patient would like to have her PFM replaced on her right lateral and then she's missing her left lateral and has an implant placed. preps, impressions, restorations of this particular uh, technician decided to use a gold abutment for one reason or another. Bond that one in and then place the implant crown. before and after. All right, those are my clinical cases and I uh, would certainly be glad to answer some questions. I think you can see with today's materials and technology, we can pretty much restore everything in an aesthetic fashion today. And the, uh, certainly composite's a wonderful material for that, but it's somewhat limited in what you can do with it by doing an indirect process, you can actually, with the composite, by the way, you are the doctor and the artist, where you can choose an artist.
with an indirect and somebody that knows about it. That's why I love, uh, again, I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, shout out to Frontier Lab in California. They do a great job for me. Any questions? Right. Thank you, Dr. Nash. That was a uh, fantastic. We've got a lot of questions. We've got 75 questions here. So okay. they, uh, but uh, a lot of them are redundant. And so I'll, I'll try and group them as best as we can. Okay. Uh, for participants, we will not be uh, answering questions regarding fees uh, due to antitrust laws in this country. So uh, you're not going to get those questions answered. Okay. First question, do you re-etch after try-in of your lithium desilicate? I do not. Um, the reason I don't is because I use water as a try-in medium. If you were to use a try-in paste, yes, I might re-etch because you may contaminate that surface. But that's why I use water as a try-in medium. If it, again, if it looks good with water, I'm going to use untinted. If I want a little bit lighter, I'll use a, a lighter looting agent, just those two colors. Uh, but if you early rinse dry and have your proxy surface, you're fine. If it is contaminated, it would flood over if it's contaminated with uh base, then I will go back in and I won't hire for it. Okay, thank you. Uh, what's the concentration of the hydrofluoric acid and how long do you use it? I think it's about 16% hydrofluoric, I believe. And uh, the, the, again, I use, I use this goes to and I'll use it for about 30 seconds. Okay. Uh, with no prep veneers, how do you communicate to the lab exactly what dimensions you desire without diagnostic wax ups? That's see, that's why you, I, I choose an artist. Uh, I really, yeah, I want to go to lab that understands occlusion and understands the dental anatomy. So I pick one that knows it. And if I have something specific, uh, I mean, I can't imagine what I would tell them differently than what I get. But if I have something specific, I'll communicate that usually by phone, verbally. But uh, generally speaking, I want, I want a lab that knows what they're doing. Okay. Uh, somebody was asking about anterior porcelain veneer preps with previous class three and four uh, composites. I think you covered that quite nicely. So that's... Thank you. That, that pretty much comes to the 360 design when that happens. Okay. Or, or proximal. We've got tons of questions about packing cord. Do you pack cord? Uh, tissue management? What do you do if you have bleeding? Uh, so we've had that question asked about 20 times here. Yeah. Well, as, as you notice, most of my patients, uh, patients don't have that at temporary removal. That's quite by design. That's why I give them the, the, the Sonic Air toothbrush. I give them all the materials. We show them how to clean it. Uh, that's an investment I make, a couple hundred dollars for the stock patients. But you got to realize, it's, I'll tell you what, well, I can't tell you what I charge. I charge enough that, that far surpasses that. And, um, but let's say I do have a problem with bleeding. Yeah, I'm gonna use cord, hemostatic agent, soft tissue laser, whatever I have. That's why I want the tissue to look that good because you don't have to do any of that. I don't use any cord if I don't have to, but if I do, I don't have any bleeding. Okay. Uh, there was a question and kind of a statement. Uh, do you take impressions at another visit? I've experienced recession when taking impression at the prep date. I don't. I take them at the prep date. And again, that, that I have to have health, health, healthy tissue. Let's say I've got patients with inflamed tissue. They might not be a candidate for elective work, but let's say we're going to do it anyway. Yes, I may very well put them in some very uh, good provisionals, let them heal that tissue, and then take compressions. But in my practice, that hardly ever happens. Okay. How do you uh, assure you get all the flowable composite off when seeding? <laughs> uh, the, oh, all the flowable composite. You know, is that, is that the, the temporary material? Yeah, I think, so. I think they were talking at the temporary. Uh, 
Yeah, and I, again, you notice I, I either use the the uh, uh, you know the suck down procedure, and then it is mechanically locked on there. It's not bonded. I don't use any bonding agent. Don't do that unless you want to make a a, a long term provision. Uh, but I I uh, whew, give me that question again. I, I think they're just basically when you relined your provisional and oh, and with how the solvable, I get that. Yeah, there's uh if the little they're probably talking about the little spot etch places, I yeah. would just take a, a just a little carbide burr and run over those little spot etch places. That's all. Just brush it off of there. And so uh next question uh is uh, along those lines. How do you remove the prototype? Do you, and do you have a special burr to cut it off? Well, first of all, they're, remember, they're mechanically held on there. They're not bonded on. So I can usually take a back action crown pepper and cut them off, even if it's in pieces. Or I'll take a black spoon and just pour them off. One while I have to make a section with the burr, and I'll section the toxins a little bit to get them off there. They usually are not difficult to do. Okay. Uh, Describe the rest seat on the facials of premolars. Is it for retention? How deep is it? All right. It, the, no, it's not for retention. It's just that when you have those facial veneers on, on premolars or molars, sometimes they'll, you won't notice, but they maybe they'll turn just a little bit, get them bonded, uh, bonded in, uh, in the wrong place. So that little facial groove is just to help them see. Now, if you go over, the the uh, um, the uh, occlusal uh, facial. Sometimes I replace the uh, facial cusp tip, and that becomes my seating area. But it's just a facial near a mole, or sometimes a little bit, but maybe you know, a quarter of a millimeter groove would help it find a place to see. Okay, thank you. Uh, how much dentin uh, exposure are you comfortable with when it comes to reliably bonding porcelain veneers? Would you ask that again, please? Uh, how much uh, uh, dentin exposure are you comfortable with? So with your veneers, if you have to come down onto a root, root surface or something, how much uh, exposed dentin are you comfortable with uh, to get consistent bonding? If, if I have 50% of the enamel left, and I'm, I'm very comfortable bonding to dentin nowadays with the bonding agents and techniques and materials we have, uh, but I want about half, half the enamel left. If not, now we're gonna go to a crown. Okay. Um, lots of questions regarding occlusion, uh, canine rise, and uh, uh, bite guards, night guards after case is completed? You know, I, I place a night guard if it's, if it's needed. And you notice the case, those cases where I had each of the legs. Once I straightened the lower teeth, I didn't have that problem anymore. Uh, but if a patient has occlusal problems, yes, we're going to prescribe a night guard afterwards. It's not routine. I'd say less than 50% of patients need a night guard. Excuse me, Jim, we're getting a lot of breakup on uh, Dr. Nash's answers. Oh, you are, okay. Um, Sorry. He was doing really, it, the sound was really good before, so I'm wondering if it's just that uh, he's leaning in and talking with his hands more than he was during the presentation. I'm not sure. Uh, let's see. Uh, Maybe. Okay, let's see. Is uh, it better now? That is, that seems to be better now. Okay. I, I feel for you. I talk with my hands too. <laughs> I do. All right. Uh, shade matching. Any tips or tricks? Takes a little practice. Uh, I, believe me, uh, I take advantage of my female employees because women have better color vision than men. It's a proven fact. Although I was a dye colorist, a chemist, before I went to dental school, and I had some training in color. But, um, I, you know, it's just use the ladies. That's all I'm saying. Yep, I would agree there. 
Uh, okay, uh, questions regarding the, uh, the, the composite used for seeding uh, the veneers. All right, I have my favorites. Can you guys hear me now? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, I was leaning in, I'm sorry. Um, I hate to say it this way, but it really doesn't matter. It comes out of what you like. I particularly like viscose materials. I've used them for a long time. I like the consistency. But you can, you can bond in a veneer with a whole composite. It doesn't matter the angles. It just comes down to handling most of the time. Any kind of a resin is going to work. Okay. Thank you. Um, it, is it okay to cure the bonding agent and the adhesive cement at the same time and save one step? I say no. If it is a light cured bonding agent, most of them are. Tokiyama's got a self cure today. But uh, I want to establish those, let's see, may, oh, it's probably my hands in front. I want to establish those fingers of resin into the enamel before I put it in the bottom. So I really do. In fact, they always do cure the bonding agent. I do know some that are very successful that cure it all at once. But I, I cure the bonding agent. Tim, it's pretty garbled. Is it on your side? So, okay. Well, uh, we'll just do the best we can here. And that's all, uh, all we can do. And uh, it, it was, the sound was good during the presentation. So okay. terrific, but we'll just uh, try. Uh, okay. Um, question regarding min minimal prep and the draw, and you were talking about mesial and distal. I think uh, people want some clarification what you mean by that draw. All right. I want the mesial. Can you hear me? Is this yes, good? sir. All right. I want the mesial and the distal to draw with one another because a veneer normally goes on from incisal to gingival, not from on to the face. And I want to be able to be able to get both mesial and distal to draw together so that that a uh, margin at the tissue is not short and so that they can build it there. So you just have to look at mesial and distal. And I don't want the facial bulk also to get in the way of that incisal to get into the testing on the Adjust the facial contour a little bit. Okay. Uh, do you place bonding agent over the silenated veneers? You know, I don't. Most of the manufacturers actually uh, have that in their instructions, but I haven't done it necessarily uh, with, the, with the looting agents that I used. If you had a real thick looting agent, perhaps you might want to put some bonding agent, but I don't routine. Okay. For veneer preps, do you prefer a chamfer or a shoulder margin? Chamfer. Chamfer margin. Okay. Okay, you answered that. Uh, are you consistent, consistently placing a desensitizer as a re-wetting agent prior to bonding and looting veneers? I've, I've, I've done that at times. I've, I've done it every time in the past, and then I stopped doing it, and then I'm doing it again today uh, because the desensitizers are so good and Actually, the bonding agents like a little bit of a wet surface, not a dripping wet. So normally I am today. I'll put some desensitizer, take it out, and then come back with my bonding agent. Okay. Um, again, questions regarding occlusion. Uh, how are you checking your occlusion? Uh, what are your thoughts after the case is seated? Well, I believe in anterior guidance and posterior disclusion, CRCO, and that type of thing. In fact, I go into all of that in my full rehab course. Uh, uh, but uh, that I want to make sure that when the patient comes forward, posterior teeth separate. I've got protrusive guidance. I like that guidance if I can, where the posterior teeth separate and then go into what's called crossover past the canine. I don't want the anterior teeth to touch. So the entire envelope function I like to see on the six anterior teeth, posterior teeth just touch in centric. Now that's not possible for everybody, but if I'm restoring anterior teeth, I can usually restore anterior teeth. Okay. 
Um, lots of questions about uh, using the Inman uh, aligner uh, retainer. Uh, I, I'll just have to say I've been using that for years and it's just a fantastic appliance. And uh, uh, Thank you. It's, it's a nice tool. Again, I'm not a, I don't do a whole lot of ortho in my practice. Uh, I've got friends that do a lot of Invisalign. That's been a really good orthodontist right around me. And I love, I love for them to do that. Uh, but the Inman aligner is such a useful only for you can burn in, you can break crowding. Um, but uh, it's it's a fantastic device. It's inexpensive. I think my lab bill's under four hundred dollars, and uh, I charge the patients. Well, I think we're not going to talk about charges, uh, yeah. but a lot a lot less than than uh, than Invisalign or anything like that. So. So yeah. it's a very useful device. Look, go online and look at InmanOrtho.com and it's all on there. It's a fantastic device. Yeah, it really is. It's, it's quite simple. Uh, it's just standard impressions uh, and standard uh, bite uh, registration and, that, uh, and that'll answer a lot of those questions there. So yes, it's uh, less ex expensive than Invisalign. Okay, we covered that. Uh, let's see. Uh, Back to veneers, how did you decide to go interproximal or not break contact? I have friends, really good dentists, that break contact every time because then all the margins are on the lingual. But it's more conservative to stop at the contact if you can. Sometimes you can't. I mean, you've got class three, you got to take it all in there. But if I have beautiful teeth, like you were saying, I want to go to the contact and not through it. It's just more conservative. Okay. Okay. Uh, would you consider a phrenectomy in that large diastema case? Yes, I would, and I have done that. Uh, it wasn't in the way in this particular case, but yeah, I could do it if necessary. Okay. And was there a reason you cured the central veneers first for the, the, the diastema case? Uh, no, I just, that particular time, I decided to put two, two and two. Just thought okay. I wanted to do that day. It looks like your assistant, Adriana, has answered a lot of the questions regarding the OxyFresh, the Sonicare, okay. the water pick, gum massager, all that. Good. Okay, Good. terrific. Thank you for doing that. Uh, Thank you, Rick. Okay, do you encounter any difficulties with retention of provisionals with temp cement on posteriors with such little surface area and no mechanical retention? That, that, um, that's a great question. That's why I use Duralon, carboxylic cement, as my cement for my onlay provisionals because you're right, they come off pretty easy. You're, you're counting on adhesion to hold the finals on. And I also find out that if I use the carboxylic cement, I don't have sensitivity on the teeth. And it holds on Sometimes you have to take it off the side uh, to clean off the uh, cement off the teeth. But it's, uh, it's, it's durable, much better, and keeps the teeth from being sensitive. All right. Uh, sorry, uh, some of the time we're getting garbled audio from your side. I don't know uh, why or, you know, it, but it was good before. So, okay, let's see. We, some, okay, Adriana answered. Yes, pa uh, Kettenbach, Panacil, Putty. Uh, what connector size are you recommending for Zerkia bridges? Say that again. The size of connectors on zirconia bridges. My feeling is that it's four millimeters square. Four by four. No. Okay. Uh, your thoughts on uh, cantilevered uh, Maryland bridges, uh, one wing, two wings. What are your thoughts there? I think one wing is just fine. Uh, again, it depends on the case. But in most cases, a single wing off the canine or off the would be just fine, probably off the canine. Okay. Terrific. 
they're asking what's that uh, material you used in the screw abutment hole that 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 stays soft <laughs> oh uh ask adriana what the new name is audrey um she typed it in somewhere it, it used to be called liquid magic uh but it it, it has a new name to it um uh, adriana if you can answer that question it'd be good Did, are they seeing her answers yeah they are seeing the answers over in q a okay. there adriana can tell you okay let's see um there was a, a back to the temporaries again uh are you removing the temporary and then re-cementing it or are you just using the shrink wrap technique i'm using shrink wrap the ones you saw earlier, which are very, very nice temporaries, uh, we would go in with the clear stent, make the temporary, tap it off, even if it broke, we go back in, finish the margins, and then put it back on with flowable composite. Take some time. You can make the shrink wrap in a lot less time, and but you do have to clean it up. You'll lacerate some tissue, but it'll all heal. Okay. Uh, lots of questions about... Uh, how do you d decide to seat one veneer at a time, two, four, et cetera? Well, as you can see, I can seat all 10 sometimes. You saw me doing that one case. Yeah. But for visuality, to be able to see what I'm doing, I usually like to go six, two and two, four, three and three. It just gives me more focus on that one area. So that's normally the way I do it. I'll do it with usually six, two and two, or if I've got three, three on both sides of six, three and three, but I'll get the anteriors done first and then place the posteriors. Okay. Uh, polycarboxylate cement uh, Duralon is great, but it's a pain in cleaning up. Uh, doesn't it in interfere with the chemical bonding? I have not found that to be the case. Uh, how do you cut through uh, porcelain fused to zirconia crowns or zirconia restorations? What brewers do you use? Uh, I use fine diamonds, but you're not going to use those burrs anymore. Yeah, that's true. It's done. It's not easy. That's why uh, you prefer not to have to remove them, but sometimes you have to. Uh, they're, they're not easy. And again, uh, there are some diamonds on the market that are made for zirconium but they go pretty fast because zirconium's, uh, you'll see some sparks. Yeah. Okay, uh, what's your average uh, prep appointment time? Let's say for uh, six veneers and the average seat time for a six veneer case. All right, let's say eight, okay? Because I hardly okay. ever do six. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, thank you. Right. As, as coming out of my mouth, I realized that, so. <laughs> If I'm going to making be making provisionals uh, with the no prep case or minimal prep, obviously it's a lot faster. But if I'm going to make a provisional, which is the vast majority of times, uh, it'll it'll I'll appoint for about three hours for prep, for uh, and provisionals, and the same thing with placement. Okay uh let's see uh how do you determine how much incisal length you can lengthen in in, in anterior veneer cases so you don't have protrusive interferences yeah that all thank you that all comes down to occlusion protrusive guidance posterior and uh it, it it's different you have to evaluate their their occlusion if i need to extend uh, an anterior tooth maybe two millimeters off that butt margin i'm comfortable if it starts getting to be more than that i want some lingual uh coverage to support that porcelain and along those lines uh with a canine guidance inclusion on ceramic veneer do we have a chance for the veneer to come off If you're guiding on the porcelain, and certainly you don't want to have your your margin uh, on the contact point. It's either short of it or past it. I don't want I don't want it to be on the contact point. Uh, but if you've got if you're using something like Emacs, 
and you're creating some anterior guidance or canine guidance, uh, it's got plenty of strength uh, to do that. And I don't hesitate to put my guidance on, on the ceramic, but I would like a little bit of lingual support uh, if I'm going more than maybe two millimeters. Okay. What is your recommendation for prophies after veneers are placed? Is it okay to use cavitrons, piezos, what polishers, etc.? Okay, no and no. No cavitrons, no piezos. Uh, so it's, it's hand scaling and you want to use fine profi paste so you don't scratch the porcelain. Not that it's gone, I mean, it'll, it'll hold up, but then you may find after a few years, the patient starts to get some staining because you've scratched the porcelain. We have some wonderful porcelain polishing uh, materials that we can, we can use today, po polishing cups and points and, and discs. Uh, but I, I don't want the hygienist to use uh, the Cavitron around my porcelain margins. Uh, if you had to adjust interproximal on veneers for proper seating, how would you do that? I would take, again, that is such a rare instance for me. I hardly mm -hmm. ever do it, but let's just say I do have a little seating problem. Uh, I'll take and mark it with a little blue interproximal. See, I'm using my hands again. And then uh, make, make the mark. You, you can also use these, the, the little floss that has the, uh, has the uh, blue color on it. And then uh, make mark it, and I'll take fine diamonds and adjust it, check it, and then polish it with the system that I showed you. All right, uh, where do you place a gingival margin when preparing veneers? I place the gingival margin at the tissue. Now, if you've got dark teeth, like tetracycline, you'll probably want to creep under that margin just a little bit, under that tissue. But my, most of my margins are right at the tissue. Okay. And uh, do we need to place a rubber dam or gingival barrier before bonding veneers? I think that would be a good idea. I haven't done it for years. I use retractors and, you know, that type of thing. Um, it's certainly a good idea to get as good of isolation as you can. And I admire some rubber dam. I do not. Yeah. I, I noticed on your uh, porcelain in it, inlays and onlays, though, you did in the posterior use yes. rubber dam. Yeah. There's a lot more wet stuff back there. Yeah, there certainly is. Okay. Uh, how could we fix the felspathic crown with the Emax veneer? You, as long as you have not uh, gone through to the metal, you can etch the porcelain just I did for that very first case. And uh, you might want to adjust the uh, shape of it a little bit and then etch and bond just like you would enamel. Uh, it's not something I think you're gonna do routinely, <clears throat> but in a case, case like that, when it's such a beautiful crown, I didn't want to remove it. Yeah. Okay, uh, I just have a, a couple of uh, questions from my, Self, uh, with your veneer cases, um, how much uh, layering are you doing into those Emax veneers? Uh, are you keeping the veneers mainly monolithic? Are you adding external stain? What are you doing? You can see on those no prep or minimal prep veneers, there's not much room for so those are monolithic. Uh, however, it doesn't take much layering to bump that color up a little bit. So almost all the veneers you saw were emaxed with layering on the surface, just a little bit of layering. And uh, I'd say um, a millimeter. Okay, and since our uh, audio is getting a little garbled here, I just want to ask you one last question uh, about those uh, veneers. Are you, is it pressed or milled lithium desilicate? Either one. Uh, I think it, at this point, uh, Frontier still waxes and presses. Uh, but you with either one, the, the milled lithium disilicate is also wonderful, and you can layer that just like you do the press. 
Okay. Terrific, Dr. Nash. Thank you very much for spending so much time with us today. We really appreciate it. Uh, Tim, fantastic. I had, a ball. I had a ball. Thank you. All right. I look forward to seeing you in person one of these days. Uh, hopefully it's sooner than later. Yeah, uh, before your hair falls out. <laughs> All righty. For those of you that asked about the CE code, there is no CE code. Uh, this is all being recorded uh, automatically. So for the period of time that you spent in the webinar today, you'll receive CE credit for that. Um, Dr. Nash, I'm going to uh, let you stop sharing your screen. I'm going to bring up my uh, screen here and so people can see what upcoming webinars uh, are available here through the Washington Academy of General Dentistry Stay Home, Stay Healthy series. And with that, uh, I'd just like to say thank you again to all our sponsors. The Washington Academy of General Dentistry brings these webinars to you free of charge during this COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, you do not need to be an AGD member. You will receive CE credit in your email inbox within uh, a few days. This webinar that you saw today will be up on our YouTube channel uh, for a period of time. And that should go up in, well, maybe four or five hours, depending on how the conversion goes on this one. It was a little longer. So that's on YouTube and just go to Washington Academy of General Dentistry. Hey, tomorrow we've got Terry Harris. Uh, we've got over 3,500 people signed up for that webinar. So we're just trying to make sure that 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 webinar will go on our end because of the technical difficulties of having that many people on there. We'd like to thank Comet USA for their support, Patterson Dental, Seattle King County Dental Society, Pierce County Dental Society, and we'd like to thank Snohomish County Dental Society as well as the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prostodontics. Uh, we look forward to uh, next week where Card P, Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prostodontics, are featuring three speakers. We also have the International Academy of Nathologies, uh, three speakers on Monday next week. And thank you to the Arkansas Academy of General Dentistry uh, for doing an Arkansas AGD uh, day. That is absolutely fantastic. Love the lineup of speakers there. So thank you very much to Arkansas for putting that together. This uh, Thursday, Omni can, uh, continues their Leadership Through Crisis uh, uh, webinar series. Uh, Bill Robbins is going to be one of our speakers next Monday. We don't have that registration information on the website yet. For these flyers that are going by and you don't see a QR code, we're working on the registration for those courses. Uh, they will be going up probably by the end of the day today. So check back. Um, uh, as I say, there's going to be a great lineup of speakers. So uh, don't forget, tomorrow we also have Penny Reed uh, speaking for us. And um, again, CE credit will be emailed to you. AGD members, your CE credit will be sent to the Academy of General Dentistry on your behalf. Uh, that CE credit should show up in two to four weeks on your transcript. Don't expect it before then. Um, and again, just want to say on behalf of the Washington Academy of General Dentistry, Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE Series, thank you for joining us. Please share these webinars with your friends, your staff. Uh, Unfortunately, we can't give you um, CE credit if you watch it on YouTube. We can only give it to you here if you watch it live. There had been some questions about whether CE uh, that's taken via webinar is uh, gets full credit, so one hour CE of webinar. Yes, it does. Uh, that all live webinars in Washington State count as uh, one hour of CE is one hour of CE uh, in terms of the Department of Health. Uh, Pre-recorded and self-instructions are not the same. Alrighty, with that, I think we're ready to sign off here. Uh, again, don't- Dr. Hess? Yes. Dr. Hess, I've been getting a couple of texts and just for clarification, the YouTube site is not Washington AGD. It is Washington Academy of General Dentistry. 
So okay. if you're looking for Washington AGD, you're not going to find us on YouTube. It has to be Washington Academy of General Dentistry. Okay. Just Thanks, like Dr. Dr. Hess has it right there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Hess. Okay. Thank you, Valerie. Is there any other announcements? Nope, that's it. Okay, with that, I'd like to thank our Executive Director, Valerie Bartoli, our panelists, Dr. Gary Hayamoto, and um, our uh, website uh, master there, Dr. Presset. So thank you. With that, uh, that's it for webinars today. Look forward to seeing you here tomorrow. Uh, and with Terry Harris. So again, you'll want to sign in early if you've signed up for that uh, uh, CE event, uh, because we just don't know how our Zoom account's going to handle all the participants. Alrighty, thank you, Valerie. I guess we can sign off. Thank you, Dr. Thank Nath. you, Dr. Hess. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Humano.